Welcome to Research Software Hour number 18 or so. I'm Richard Darst from Alto University, and here with me are... Um, I'm Anne from the University of Oslo in Norway. And Tadevan from Tromso. It's so nice to see you all. Nice to be back after a break. And outside is a snow, snow plow here, so it will be loud. I will just use it quick. <laughs> okay. So this is our, we're starting 2021 now, and um, we sort of master planned what we're going to talk about. So we have a list of different topics, which is on our website, and we'll sort of go through and explain sort of all the different aspects which a researcher may need to know to be productive. Not all of them are necessary for everyone, of course, but everyone can probably learn something from every episode. So who are we here for? So Radovan, who do you think that we're presenting for? It will be maybe really loud, but I will try. Um, <laughs> can you hear the plow from outside? Is it bad? It's not too bad. A little bit, that's OK. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Well, who are we here for? We are here for students, researchers, scientists, staff, people like us. Um, mm -hmm. So people who write research code or want to write research code or people who are using research code or people who are, who are using computing resources or data storage resources and I think persons who want to learn from others. Yeah. So Anne, how would you update that for your... That's a bit tough to update. <laughs> it was quite comprehensive. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the only thing I, I would add is uh, it's really for everyone. So don't be scared mm -hmm. by uh, uh, like the maybe the vocabulary we will be using. It's, uh, it's really for everyone. So if there is anything you don't understand, just uh, ask in the HackMD. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really great, uh, great summary there, for everybody. And that we all want to learn. We don't know everything. Actually, we don't know yeah. most things. Mm -hmm. We are also spectacularly unprepared. Always. <laughs> yeah. So it's completely fine. Yeah. And as for me, I think that this is for people that use computers to do their work, but are scientists, but not really software developers. So if you're a professional developer, this is probably like basic your daily life and too basic for you. But if you're a scientist, there's many things that you need to know about software and data management, which you may not have learned anywhere. And we're here to give you the sort of practical story and not the theoretical story. And I can also add that what, what, what we do here, we, we re record it and we put it then also on YouTube. So on the website, you can then also see all the past editions. Mm -hmm. yes. And I think we will also soon look at the website because we have a program for, like this year we want it to be a bit more organized. So we have a, <laughs> We have a plan for the next weeks until summer. Yeah. So we are unprepared, but we have a plan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe who would like to share the program? I guess I can open it. Yes, yeah, so I put the link in the the link is in the Hackandy. And if also maybe we should repeat where the Hackandy can be found. Huh? If oh yes. Somebody's watching. Yeah, so the way this works, we want to interact with anyone who may be watching us live. So instead of the chat, we have this shared document, which you can find in the channel description. Or I will also put it in the Twitch chat. And if you scroll to the very bottom, there's a question section. Write your question there and then we will see it and can respond either on stream or someone can respond via chat there. But for now, here is our plan.
would someone like to talk about it? It's very long here right now. Okay, so today we're talking about the sort of, we're giving a big summary picture over all the different facets which are relevant to a scientist working on coder data. In two weeks, we will talk about working in shells and terminals and sort of provide our practical hints on things. On March 4th, which is two weeks after that, we'll talk about data and then go on and basically try to take one of these topics each week or every two weeks and see how it goes. Of course, changes can always happen. Yeah, and suggestions welcome. And so we, we, we thought about switching to a rhythm where we stream every two weeks, but maybe we will do something in, also in the off week. And I think a couple of really fun uh, topics planned. Uh, so one where we want to talk about our favorite Python libraries, later also our favorite R libraries. Would be really mm -hmm. fun if somebody who's using R <laughs> can show us. Yeah. This. And that's maybe what uh, no what we would like this year, like maybe mm. some contribution from people, like mm. an interview, or you want to come with your R package, or yeah, want to show something. Is it something we want or not? Yeah, anyone who would like to be a guest speaker, please yeah get in contact with us. That would be great. So, what are we talking about today? What's this Zen of scientific computing thing? I wasn't sure. So. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I guess no one's so. really sure. Yeah. But it sounds good. It's a thing, it's a presentation I tried to give, it, maybe it was almost two years ago by now, that sort of um, introduces us to, or introduces someone to all the different things which may be necessary. And it tries to do it in a non preachy kind of way. So instead of saying everything needs to be perfect, it gives everyone the opportunity to improve different things a little bit, which I think is something that's really missing. You can find many things that say, this is the right way to do things, but no one has the mental energy to do everything right. And no one needs to do everything right for every project. I mean, we all started doing stuff wrong and slowly improved. So why can't everyone else as well? So that's sort of the idea here. We'll talk about different things and then give you a ladder to improve them in your work and some resources for where you may start. This can be useful to you if you are an experienced researcher and you need to improve stuff a little bit more. It can be useful to you if you're just starting and want to know what lies ahead of you. You might even be a supervisor and you are going to be going to have students that need to do things well and you really need to know how to advise them to do that. Oh, what they need to know and where they can find the resources. Yeah. Actually, sometime in a few weeks, we might have a session dedicated for supervisors in order to show how to, um, like, how to set up your group well. Anyway. Sounds good, yeah. Oh, sorry, I didn't want to interrupt, but I also put a link to the to a paper at the uh, bottom of the mm. comment section, uh, the good enough practices in scientific computing. It's a great paper, and oh, I yes. especially like the title. I really like that it's not mm -hmm. the best practices. Yeah. Yes. Good enough practices. Did you know that they had a previous paper that was called best practices or something like that? Yes, yes. Yeah. And yeah. then they came back and said, okay, maybe we can do something a bit more practical. So, good story. So, should we get started? Zen of computing, computing, yes. Show uh, us uh, what it is about. Here's my screen again. And this link is going to be in the HackMD and Twitch. Um, let's see. So, um, yeah, 
So I think uh, there is a wrong link pasted to Twitch. Oops, that is not supposed to be there. Uh, yeah. Well, I can't do anything about that. There we go. Mm. So, yes. Okay. So what's Zen of scientific computing? So I guess you can read the intro here as well as I can. But I think I've seen many people who are doing research that uses programming and they feel like everything is very fragile and just might fall down at any time. Um, so. And it never yeah. happened to you, no? <laughs> Oh, it's happened before. Yeah. <laughs> Luckily, not for a while, but um, every so often I get to some projects and I realize that I haven't laid a good foundation here and things don't really work. OK, and... so you are talking about foundation. Uh, so yeah. this is uh, the key part, or? Yeah. Well, I guess I might sort of say so. Like, there's the things that we're doing are the foundation in order to do your science using your code. Can I ask, is it getting, is it getting better? So is the, is, is the code that we are writing getting more robust or less, hmm. or less huh. robust? That's a good question. How do you define robust? Yeah. I mean, I I'd think say, we will find out. Hmm. Yeah. I'd say overall, I'm slowly getting better. Partly it's old projects go away and new ones come in that are set up better, but anyway. But are projects so, really going away? Because the code <laughs> yes, that's what back. I wanted. Well, that's good. <laughs> I mean, small things go away, big things stay. And that's sort of the whole problem here, isn't it? So actually before the show, we were discussing this production code versus research code thing and had some disagreement. Some <laughs> so I had written here before that production code is something where you sort of know what the target is, and the code is actually the outcome of the project that keeps being maintained. But in research code, you don't know exactly what you're trying to do, and you sort of explore and continually change it, and so on. And the code is secondary, but your paper or results or something are what comes out of it. And Radovat had an interesting counterpoint here. Yeah, what I was writing on the chat is that, yeah, I wasn't sure about this because the research code, oh, as, as soon as it is not testing anymore, it's kind of production. I mean, we, mm -hmm. if, if it produces published results, this was production. That's one thing. The, 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 other, the other concern was that if we look at it this way, we imagine that like everything that is not research code is really super good code, mm -hmm. very well designed, mm -hmm. and they knew exactly what they wanted, and it's really working and robust and tested and documented, and I'm not so sure about it. Yeah. It's because here you put like production was like more professional software mm -hmm. development in a company, mm -hmm. like professional software development. Yeah. Because when I read it, I didn't see it this way. I was thinking about like a researcher. Yeah. Uh, starting with a, like a research because you explore the algorithm. Yeah. And then you go and run your production mm -hmm. code. So it, yeah. it's good that you clarify what you mean when you write. Yeah. So I sort of agreed with, or I thought Radovan's point was really interesting yeah. here. Like, you know, research code can become something important that needs to run later. So I think that maybe I got the terminology here wrong. Like research code isn't really a good term because it's not code for research, but like testing code or code that's being testing something and you don't know um, what the long-term plan is. Okay, so, so I also misunderstood. Okay, yeah. so don't be agree. That's so also like, clear, yes, yeah. yeah. So like, say, test code might be my analysis scripts, which run some other stuff and then eventually goes go away. But I can also have code for research, 
which is going to be used five years from now and has to be very well maintained so it can evolve. So how do we make it? Uh, sh shall we make it research code or production code? Yeah. How, where do we start? I mean, that's the problem, isn't it? Like stuff can start as testing code and then yeah. you realize it becomes important and then suddenly a bunch of people are using it, but you have no idea what it does anymore. And that's sort of bad. So that's why we need to have like good uh, methods from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Well, or as Most I would likely. say, appropriate to the good enough, like good enough and appropriate to the task. So, um, and something where you can improve it later if you need to. So maybe I might even classify these production code is something that has to be maintained for the future. And then test code is something you write and eventually you stop modifying it. And that is the end of it. So anyway, um, and then there was this research code pyramid. So I was really trying to think of someone like, we can't tell people that everything has to be perfect. That just doesn't work. So instead you have a bunch of daily stuff, which is what you're working on. And that might be a little bit hackish, not really well put together. But that has to build on something which is a little bit better. So it builds on some of your same code, which has been used and reused and is tested a little bit more. And that gets built on things that other people have done. Like if you're using Python, you might be using NumPy, Pandas, SciPy, all these kinds of things, which have to really be um, tested well and rigorously maintained. And they can't really afford to do things that are going to break them in the future. And then on top of that, you're building on things like your operating system, like Linux or Python or things like that. And you don't need to use all of the tools that Python, like the people developing Python or Linux use when you're making your analysis script to see if a project is worth continuing anymore. And if we tell people to do that, it's just not going to work. So the other options are down here. So if you don't put enough work, then you have some daily stuff, which is built on your hacks from a month ago, which is built on more of your hacks from a year ago, which is built on top of your operating system. And that's just unstable and is probably going to fall down pretty easily. So the too much work alternative here is where you try to make everything perfect. There's just too much there. So I think there's some sort of pyramid. So you, you should build on a good base. And as you get to closer to your daily work, then um, you put less and less effort into it. But your daily work, your pyramid gets higher and higher, and your daily stuff becomes the base of your next thing. So I've divided everything up into levels of um, maturity or something like that. Yeah, this pyramid reminded me of this XKCD comic, which I placed on into the HackMD, oh. the dependency one. I don't know if you saw oh. one. Maybe. Should I open That's it a here? very good one, yes. You should show it to me. Because it's... Uh, because it... So it's, it talks about this some random person in Nebraska thanklessly maintaining since 2003. So that person may not even know that some other stuff <laughs> depends on it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that, to me, that is really... That's a very good one, uh, yeah. Research code. Yes. <laughs> Yes, yeah. that's research infrastructure. <laughs> yeah. And it's really scary to think of these kinds of things. I mean, have you ever published a paper and said, oh, I hope that no one gets too interested try in this it. because <laughs> they might actually try it and who knows if it will work? That sure doesn't I feel hear very it very good. often, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But okay. let's try to be slightly better. We'll try to yeah. slightly to improve step by step. Yeah. So like stealth code, like under the radar, hopefully it doesn't show up. <laughs> mm -hmm. So what aspects can we improve? So this is the 
real important part of this event. So first we have version control. Who can tell us about that? So what does it do? At least it tries to keep track of your changes and your history. I mean, for me, this is my memory, which mm -hmm. I don't have. Mm -hmm. But practically, um, what kind of suggestion could we give to people yeah. about person control? Yeah. So. I'm going to really invest time in it because I think it's worth it. Mm -hmm. I, guess. I, I just I thought just before this stream that have I ever regretted tracking something under version control? I don't think I ever regretted doing yeah. that. The other way around, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes you say, "Ah, oh, yeah, I don't need a version control for this." Yeah, and, and you also, regret usually it. You regret that. Yeah. And also, you, when you said that uh, your memory is the same thing for me, also I have terrible memory, and mm -hmm. I've been already looking at code. Mm -hmm. which I didn't recognize. I didn't recognize the code, but the version code control was telling me. I mean, the evidence was pointing at that I have This written. is you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I had the same thing. Sometimes yeah. I even criticize the code. Oh, this is really poor code. And then it says, yeah. Um, oh, yeah, OK. <laughs> yeah. Like, to no, me, what is, uh, oh, sorry. Go, go ahead. ahead. Like, to me, the classic problem solved by version control is whenever you have some code and then you make a change and you make another change and suddenly everything's broken and you have no idea what you did and you can't go back and you end up spending several days trying to debug it and undo all the problems you've caused. And there's just no reason for anyone to be in this situation. So you have to always track what happens in the past. And there's really no excuse to not do anything. So it saves a lot of time. That's uh, maybe what you can see in short, no? Yeah. And I wanted so. to add that because it says that it's essential for any type of collaboration that is true. But it's also, I think, really essential for single person right. yes. or, or projects also. So even if it's if I will never show this to anybody and never collaborate, still it will save me time. Yeah. So we've sorted stuff into different levels here. And I should say these different levels are not very deep or anything. It's basically what a few of us have sort of made up and um, or if there's anything bad, I made it up. If it's good, it's because of discussions with other people. But basically some sort of progression from nothing to something that's suitable for even the biggest of projects. So the L0 is not an option. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you can do nothing. So how would it work with just a local repo? Like, what's the typical workflow there? Git init. Mm -hmm. And, and then one. git commit. Git, commit, git add, git commit, yes. Yeah. Okay. So what's git? That's the most common uh, version control now. Yeah. It's maybe for the next five, ten years, who knows? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So if you need to invest yeah. uh, in one version control, I think that's probably the one yeah. we can suggest to yeah. everyone. And even if you use something else, you'll probably work with someone eventually that does use it. Yeah. So yeah, like with the level one thing, you just have it is only on your computer. It's not connected to any server. And the directory basically keeps its own changes. So what's a little bit above that? To put it on the web so that it's backed up, but also accessible yeah. for others. So how do people use that then? I mean, here you said this for multiple collaborators but you mm -hmm. can also i i use uh for instance uh, this shared repo only for mm -hmm. myself that's a good like, point uh, this github we should add another level in there hmm. let's make a note yeah exactly like backup but also to share between two different yeah computers. which you were mentioning exactly yeah it's, it's more or less the same level because there is no extra effort mm -hmm. to to achieve it's just different function yeah, yeah and another bonus is that 
you can actually show the work to somebody if it's open. Mm -hmm. So it can it can be a nice like yes. CD uh, to demonstrate yes. where this is my output. Yeah. And then finally, if you're a really big project, you have it in some repository on the web, and then anyone in the world can send you changes via a pull request, which is especially what's used for the massive open source projects where many people work together. And that's sort of the point of, well, that's where GitHub became popular by having this pull request based workflow, which made it really easy to accept contributions from other people. So yeah, I guess most people probably won't make projects which, well, not every project will become a massive open thing where you're taking many requests via pull request, but um, almost everyone will have some projects which are on the web and shared among a few people so you can work together. So what is the advantage to put it on the web, even if this is for yourself? Like as a researcher, why should I share it on the web? Well, is it a good so, practice, even for simple hmm. code? So do you mean open or private? Uh, the, the fact you I don't guess. keep it local. So then you yeah. start mm -hmm. to have it on GitHub and it's mm -hmm. probably open. Or is it a good suggestion for people yeah. starting using version control? Yeah. So, I mean, if nothing else, it can be on the web. Just so if your computer fails, then you have a copy. Mm -hmm. Or you can synchronize it between multiple computers. I heard a story recently, someone was working with a student and everything was on their laptop and the hard drive failed and they lost their recent code, which is bad, but they also lost the trained model, which was in the paper, which they, which was currently under review. So when those reviews come back and they need to reproduce the work, they literally can't do it again. It just gone. And this is a horrible situation to be in. And putting it on the web in a private repository on GitHub or something solves this problem. If I can add one more motivation would be that even if you don't intend to collaborate with somebody, if you put it out there and make it discoverable, I mean, you at least open up the possibility to collaborate. Maybe somebody will find mm. that it's really useful and mm. contact you want to want to start a new project Yeah. or send the random uh, bug fix. Right. For me, it's also nice to see if somebody picks up the code and uses it for whatever they want to use it. I mean, it feels good to me mm -hmm. to see that. Yeah, that's good. Yes, yeah, that's right. for sure. It's motivating. Yeah. And we have some resources here. So uh, GitHub, Code Refinery, GitLab. Uh, GitHub is a commercial service. GitLab is an open source project which many institutions use for their own Git repository. GitLab is also a free web service like GitHub, and there's many other options. And to learn how to use Git, there is many different lessons online. So I guess we can point you to the Code Refinery lessons, and you can come to a Code Refinery workshop also, and which we can talk about at the end. And there's also Software Carpentry, which has a novice Git lesson. So we spent a lot of time talking about version control, but that's really sort of what underlies everything else that we're going to say. So good version control enables almost anything else we're talking about. Any final well, words before these, we move on? Uh, uh, sorry for jumping in, but yeah, many of these tools that we'll mention, they integrate with like Git and GitHub, GitLab. Yeah. So they really tie in. Yeah. So anything else before we move on? We could talk about uh, a lot of things, but yeah. uh, I, I think we... I guess we should go on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So next up comes modular code. So how to keep our code um, easily reusable. So if everything is one giant mess that's put together, 
then it's really hard to take out a useful piece and use it somewhere else. But modularity is sort of the key to making things reusable. So there's the different levels here. So you might start off with just a bunch of copy-paste scripts, which um, like none of them refer to any of the other ones. And when you need to reuse something, you make a copy in the new place. And that's usually how most of my projects start. So it's something. That's prototyping. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, do the, I do that too. I, yeah. I copy paste on the web. I try it out. Yeah. I copy again. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Then you remember that, oh, oh yeah, I worked on it. I have something already like that. Yeah, exactly. By the way it was. Oh yeah, it was there. And then you copy paste all of some other project. Yeah. Yes. And then after you do this copying and pasting enough, eventually the you realize what the patterns are. And you can copy it once and put it somewhere into some sort of library or module, which can be imported into the other things. So when you need to improve something, you improve it in one place instead of many different places. And the module by itself. Oh, sorry. Yeah. And the module by itself is sort of useful, but not the end here. So then when you go further, you can get to these modules and make them well-maintained libraries. For example, like NumPy. NumPy probably started off as a few functions someone was making, and then they kept um, giving it more structure until it became something which almost all other scientific Python packages become based on. And it's not like they go straight to NumPy. So there was numeric before that. There was something called NumArray before that. And over time, they've slowly adapted these and put them together and eventually got something which is maintainable indefinitely into the future. But in the, I mean, modular code, uh... Do we talk also about like the style or the way you write your function, or is it only this division between yeah. function, no function? Mm. Yeah, so somehow it, it also has to be about how you write the functions too. Like you can write a function where it's not easily reusable or it is reusable. Yeah. And that's something I really don't know how to explain or teach this very well. Does anyone have any ideas here? Oh, Radovan uh, has very good examples <laughs> normally when yeah. we do this modular code. <laughs> it is maybe a bit too long, but... Yeah, but... so like I mentioned that I think functions that are reusable are time independent. Mm. So they behave the same today, tomorrow, yeah. and in two weeks. Mm -hmm. so they, independent they, on yeah. the, of the context, no? Yes, uh, yeah, exactly. That is really good. Depend independent of the context. Because I was also thinking, oh, how would I define modularity in practice? And to me, that is, I can take something from project A, I can put it into project B, mm. and it still works. And then it has to be independent of the context. Yeah. Yeah. And another thought that just came up that was, I think, also key to modular code, and that is really difficult, is uh, packaging. Like knowing mm. how to yes. package stuff in Python, R, C, mm. Fortran. Um, and like these libraries or even beyond yeah. libraries. Yeah, how all it mm. works, like Conda mm. and... Uh, like distribution of your... Uh, so yeah. or... And it, it's really a lot of things and I I didn't know it and I still don't know most of it. And, but somehow one needs to know if, if you want to make that easier. Mm -hmm. Because the yeah. alternative is that you try to invent your own solution for it, mm -hmm. which I don't recommend, but I tried it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. OK, and in Code Refinery, we have a modular code development lesson, which is written by Radovan. And the latest iteration is actually quite good, but it's something that you have to see in order to. You have um, to see him live. No? You have to see it live. <laughs> um, yeah, but I mean, many people have contributed to this. Yeah. And actually, yeah, I think sense. this link goes to the old version and not the current version. 
Okay, mm, not should sure. we continue? Yeah. To organized workspaces. So I wonder what I really meant here. I think it's basically organize your directories well so that you can find things in the future. So um, a bad example is when all your files are just directly in the directory and you have version one, version two, version three, and so on. So a little bit better is you start separating out the different kinds of data. So you have a code directory, you have the original directory, you have the manuscripts directory, you have the scratch and outputs and results and so on, which means that these can all be managed separately so that it's easy to clean up the scratch without deleting the other stuff. Or it's easy to take the code and send it to someone else without mixing in data that might be confidential or not. Yeah, it likes to separate the source and the object or things like that, if you have compiled codes. and So is it within one project or when you have several projects or both? Mm. Well, yeah, so then here I wrote the top level is separating the different projects together. So. Mm -hmm. For example, the extreme case might be you have one project which is just about the code and one project which has the data and the analysis scripts for that thing. And then you're breaking these up so they're logical to organize. I don't have any real good sources for high level organization systems. So I guess what I've started doing, I have one Every project has to get a name, and then this name has to be unique and clear, and then there's one directory for the project, and I don't make them recursive. So I don't put projects inside of other projects, so I can always find the things. So project, all the projects at the same level. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, sounds good. So the thing that I'm struggling with is that there are really many good systems. Mm -hmm. And even if you decide on a really perfect system, it doesn't really matter because oh, we, we often collaborate with others. Mm -hmm. They use different every, system. <laughs> yeah. And every project prefers a different perfect system. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, I can't organize it my way. I have to. And, and OK, I'm working on too many projects, but so, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I, I so how do it. you do that? You adapt? Because I, I tend not to. At the beginning, I was very picky, and I mm. wanted things to be like this. And, mm. and then now I say, OK, whatever. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> there are a few things I, I, I really p still picky, like the documentation. I mm. want to have it with a source mm -hmm. a folder. Or yeah. the, but uh, otherwise, I'm. I'm becoming quite flexible, so maybe I yeah. should read it again and uh, go back to more yeah. structured. I mean, I think there's really nothing to do other than try to help every project get a little bit better. And did we mention the lottery factor? No, can you say that? So uh, the project should be organized in a way that if one person wins the lottery and and quits job tomorrow that it's still understandable to everybody else in the project and that it can still continue mm -hmm. so there is a common understanding of where things are and that yeah. it can still be found and this is exactly how we work in academia <laughs> <laughs> yeah i guess that's probably a big part of why academic code is so hard to keep maintained because people do keep leaving all the time. And what do you do? That's just life. So should we go on? So workflow automation. So what would this mean? So sometimes I see people with a huge amount of data and whenever they need to run something, they type the commands to run it each time. And that doesn't scale to doing things on hundreds of different input files. And also, you can't really remember what you've even done. And 
it's not sustainable. Yeah, and even even if you remember, and even if it's not hundred, but maybe only twenty, it's it could be that the eighteenth one I make a mistake mm -hmm. because I. Oh yeah, that's a wrong. very good point. And yeah. then I will not maybe even notice it. Yeah. I think the motivation, I, yeah, no, go on. Go ahead. The, the motivation for me would be also that I, I would be fed up to repeat <laughs> to someone yeah. all the list of steps, which I don't even remember myself. So I will have to try every time. Yeah. So having a place uh, where I could write uh, what yeah. I should do, it's a gain for my memory, probably. Yeah. Yeah, I think this memory thing's really important. Like for me, the classic case is when the paper reviews come back and then someone has to yes. recreate the same figures. Almost everyone I know really struggles to make it work the same way at all and to get those same graphs again. And it really doesn't make That's sense. That's a very like, good point, yes. The computer should be able to do the same thing with the same input, but we just don't program it to do that. So that's where the workflow automation comes in. So what are the different levels here? So level zero is already quite uh, not too bad, no? Here. <laughs> to even have scripts? <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. Bunch of scripts. I found this is hmm. better than uh, maybe, most cases. <laughs> maybe instead of scripts, it should say a bunch of code that you have to run oh manually. yeah okay so it's uh yeah, okay yeah independent mm -hmm. you don't know in which order to run them right that's yeah. what you mean by this mm -hmm. yeah and then we get to you might write a single script yourself that runs your code in a certain order to get a certain output which is that's already good. quite good yeah. yeah you know that that might be enough and then above that, there's things like complete workflow management tools, where you basically define every step, and then you tell it, I need this output, and it will figure out what steps it needs to run, and then get those outputs out of it. And that's basically all. It can save you a lot of time, but I think it's, mm -hmm. it's maybe some investment at the beginning. Yeah. Which is difficult to um, to justify for yeah. a researcher. I, I think that's a feeling I have. It's, yeah. it's not so easy. Yeah. Remember one project, I guess it was more than 10 years ago now, I actually wrote a make file, which I could run a single command and get all of my results out of it. So the nice. things I learned, make is not really what I, what you want to use for this kind of thing. Yeah. Even... 10 years ago. And second, it really is a lot of work and might not, and not, not really worth it for every project. I haven't done something so complete ever since then. Instead, I have these management scripts which sort of get me things. But it depends on what your needs are. So if you're doing But some... if, if you are using uh, like some management uh, system tools like SnakeMake, mm -hmm. I really uh, find uh, this is very close to write a standard script. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the, is, once you understand how it works, the investment is, is not very big and the benefit is huge. Right, yeah. yeah. Maybe not on your laptop <laughs> mm -hmm. because it cannot run in parallel, for instance. Right, yeah. Is Jupyter, like Jupyter Notebooks and R Markdown, is that also pipeline automation? Hmm. I mean, in a way, this is like a script, no? Yeah. yeah. I, mean, I was just trying to distill it into like a recommendation, and I think I would yeah. recommend to make it easy to generate the figures the second time, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. the first time will never be enough. Right. I yeah. think we always have to do like a little tweak, or two days before the deadline. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm yes, for... never believe you will make your figure only once. Yeah. And for Jupyter, I've seen good things, which is like complete notebooks you can run from top to bottom and you get the same output. And I've also seen some where you can't run it top to bottom and you have to find the right cells and run them in the right order. Mm. And that's, that's not, not good, good practice. I would, so yeah. It's more about how you do it than what you do. 
And Co Refinery yeah. has a lesson on reproducible research, which may be relevant if you are learning these things. Should we go on to reproducibility yes, you're, you're, of the yeah. environment? Well, yeah, we have still a couple of, oof, we have many things to come up with. Yeah, we've got quite a few, but they're going to get faster now, I think, and shorter. Yeah, because you so. talk about already quite a lot of reproducibility. So yeah. now, what is the difference between what you said before, yeah. for instance, with workflows and yeah. the environment? So to me, environment is things like getting the same packages and dependencies installed, like getting NumPy, SciPy, Pandas installed, or getting the C libraries you need to compile your project and things like that. And this is something that's easy to forget. So you can easily do it once and then, well, it works so you don't go back to it. Or you can easily uh, make it basically automated. So you can go to any computer and install all of these things and anyone else can also run your code. For example, in Python, this is what the requirement.txt file means. So it says, this is what I have to install with certain versions in order to run this code. Or that is what, mm, let's see. Or like the conda environment.yaml file is needed. So these things like conda and virtual environment for Python or other languages are like create the whole environment together. On the top level here, so containers are a concept which basically packs an entire operating system into a single file so that you can run this file and then everything will always work the same way. So this explanation is not quite technically correct, but is a good enough approximation. So yeah. And these are this is also discussed in the code refinery reproducible research lesson. Any other comments before we go on? Huh. Let's go to documentation. So Anne had some opinions about documentation, so I'd love to hear those. <laughs> Yeah, I said I want to have the documentation with the code in the mm -hmm. same uh, in the same project. Mm -hmm. So how do you do that? How do you do that? Mm -hmm. uh, what do we use uh, normally, like read the doc for writing, mm -hmm. for I mean publishing the documentation? But the simple, I would start with a readme, mm -hmm. as probably mm -hmm. every time I create a new project. The first file I will create is a readme file, and yeah. this is already a documentation. And honestly, I will keep it probably for quite a while mm -hmm. while the project start, starts to develop. And only when I have something which I think can be like released, mm -hmm. I would start proper documentation. And the yeah. documentation, I will start with examples and tutorial. I don't know what, yeah. what would you do? Makes sense. Many of my projects, it's just a readme file. And over time, I add more and more things. And I only get more advanced than that when the readme gets so long that yeah. it needs to use. I'll always use Sphinx as my documentation generator. But you can go a long way with a readme file. Yeah, I agree. Even for like proper released code, if if the if I don't if we don't need to scroll so much through the readme, I think it's completely fine. Yeah. Once it becomes a bit too much to scrolling, then. Yeah. So as you might expect, Code Refinery has a lesson on documentation, which <laughs> covers a lot of these things. So next up is testing, and this is a big one. Who would like yes. to talk about this? Well, you can start, yes. Me. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Yeah. 
So, I mean, every code is tested at least once, and that's when you run it to see if it does <laughs> what you expect. But the question is, when you do this first test, do you ever test it again? And do you know it stays correct? So instead of just testing it by hand and then hoping it doesn't break in the future, you can add in things called unit or integration or system test or things like that, which you can run automatically. For example, PyTest is a common thing that's used for Python to do these. So you make separate test files, which are really easy. They're basically just Python source files that have functions called test underscore something in them. And then it runs it and then sees if the function gives an error and then prints out a nice report. And then that gets you started. And then once you get a bit more advanced, you can have it do this automatically. So your web repository, which is hosting it, can run these tests. And you get things like running tests every night just to make sure it's right, running tests on every single commit you do, running tests before you accept pull requests from people. Like if someone sends you a proposed change, it's hard to tell if it's correct or not, but it's easy to see if the test passed and to be confident in your test suite. And if I can add to it, because you, you said at the beginning that uh, yeah, we tested the first time, but do we ever test it again? I actually think that the developer who develops the code tests it again and again and again and again. Mm -hmm. So if I develop my own code, I look at it every day. Mm -hmm. and if it's relatively manageable, I may immediately notice when it's not working anymore. Right. Because yeah. I know what to look at and I know mm -hmm. it and I was going, oh, what, what is doing? But the problem is that nobody else, mm -hmm. the problem is that if somebody else picks up the code, uh, it's mm. it's difficult for them to mm. see is this still working because it produces some numbers but yeah say whether they are still correct or not so by not so if I only know how to find out whether this is still working or not mm. I make it really difficult for people to call to collaborate and reuse it and change it yeah that's a very good point yes but I think there's also things like something that still runs and it just gives a wrong answer but doesn't immediately raise an error. And as a scientist, you really need to catch these as quickly as possible. Yeah. Or for example, you're working on B this week and what you do on B breaks A and you won't figure that out until next week. And by then it's too late to fix it easily and it's a lot more work. Anyway, so so yeah. you write test as um, as you write the code. So every time you write something, you write a test. Yeah. I mean, uh, is that more or less what you are suggesting? But yeah. is it really true? Well, most people don't, but that's the dream, at least. Some people. But realistically, well, how do you really work? Because uh, I mean, we always say yeah. to people they have to do it every time they write a function. Mm -hmm. But the truth is not how we do it. Mm -hmm. At least that's not how I do it. So how yeah. do we do it? Let's be, let's be honest now. Yeah. So, I, I do it from time. I mean, I, I dedicate mm -hmm. usually like one day on test and then I, <laughs> I, I write test. I, I have very hard time to like write a code and then write a test just after. Yeah. I tend to delay and then I tell I say, okay, now I write all the tests for maybe mm -hmm. 10 functions. Mm -hmm. I don't know. How do you do it, Radovan or Richard? Yeah, also delaying, not testing everything. But I normally invest into tests before doing a big rewrite. Yes. If I know that I have to really rewrite the whole thing because it became a mess, then I, write, then I often write the tests because I want to have some like safety, you know, protection. To check, yes. That's a good mm -hmm. point. Yeah. I would say that when I start a project, it's small, and I usually don't immediately do tests. I might make one test with just runs the whole thing with some sample input data to test complete breakage. But then it gets to a point and I realize, OK, this is actually useful, what I've written. And other people may use it and contribute. So then I'll do a big round and try to write tests for everything that I can see at the time. And then from there on, I'm a little bit better of writing a test whenever I make 
a new function or new changes. But below this sort of threshold of usefulness, like, there will hardly ever be any tests in my code. Can we ask the audience also to? Hmm. Oh, yes, I wanted to, can yes. Be honest. <laughs> <laughs> But one thing we, you didn't mention yet is like the uh, continuous integration testing, like the automation mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. running test. Because I don't, I don't like. I tend to delay uh, the writing yeah. of some tests, but automation is something I usually do very at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Because it's it's literally fought for what you can gain. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. I might not do it right at the beginning, but that's sort of in these early like whole system tests where I would do that. And uh, automation so. is really fantastic, but also something I learned later is that also automation needs to be maintained, not mm -hmm. only the code, because it's also code. Mm -hmm. Also the yes. testing thing is actually code. And if, if I let it sit for one year. Um, it breaks, yeah. yeah. Even the testing can break itself, like just the testing code itself, because mm -hmm. everything is evolving. Yeah, yes, that's a good point. Yeah. So we what have happens is that I do, I have this some project and it gets finished and it's small and it's tested, and then I don't touch it for one year and one year later somebody sends a tiny tiny improvement. Uh, yeah, and, it breaks. and then all the testing breaks, but it's yes. not their fault, but it's just because everything changed since. Yeah. Yes. Uh, like the dependencies and uh, mm -hmm. operating system. Yes, that's right. So then you say, why do I have automatic testing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Should you be using dependencies that are going to completely change in a year? Sometimes it's, but it's just, um, um, but what if you use, it's like all uh, the GitHub actions if you use, I don't know, Ubuntu latest. Yeah. It's that thing. I mean, that, that will, in three years, Ubuntu latest will be different than today. Mm -hmm. And I know that, but I still use it. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yes, I, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But if you don't do, do it, what would you do? Maybe you would take something and it, it would break because it is not available anymore? Or it's, uh, I don't know. I mean, what, what, it's probably the best uh, we can do. So. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I mean, like I try like something like NumPy, I'm somewhat sure it's not going to break in backwards compatibility, backwards incompatible ways that are going to break my code in the future. So to me, that's a good dependency. Depending on Ubuntu latest, I'm also fairly confident with because the like Unix interface is very well defined and established. And like if the people that are developing it know they can't make things too backwards incompatible. But then I also try to restrict my usage to the parts that I think are least likely to change. And like I'll put an extra effort to do that rather than take the easy way out that might break in a few years. Speaking of easy way out, so the question came in on HackMD. Yeah. Where do we place tools like MyPy? So this is this is a library to check types, mm -hmm. type annotations in Python, yeah. to make sure that types are matching up, or something like st static code evaluators. Mm -hmm. Where do we place that in the hmm. Zen? If I understood the question correctly. Yeah, that's a good question. Like there could be some idea or new section on develop it development environment or things like that. Yeah, so, like you don't put and... it in modular or? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Oh, maybe, maybe it's in maybe modular it. or things like that. Yeah. Also formatting the standard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm, yeah. But I think modular code development. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can also do things like run them during the automated testing to ensure that there's no yeah. type errors or things like that, or the code is formatted to as well. So as expected, Code Refinery has a lesson on automated testing. So should we go on yeah. to licensing? Ooh, licensing. <laughs> this is interesting, isn't it? So 
if you want people to use your code, which you probably do if you want them to cite you, and if the code doesn't have a license, then they're probably not going to want to use it and build on it. Or they might and just not tell anyone because the license is unclear and you don't get any credit for it. Mm. So, and the you can be you. I mean, the, uh, the other person can be you. Mm. It's usually you as mm. a researcher because a researcher, you usually yeah. change affiliation very, very often. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it can be a way to not lock yourself out of your own code. Yeah. If you if it's under an open source standard license. Mm -hmm. But no license, you see, say this is like L0. Is it an option well, to I have mean, no license? You can not um, clarify anything. And then it's basically no one can do anything because they don't know. Or even worse, you combine code from different sources. Like you go find someone's code and you take it and you start using it and then you take someone else's code and you start using it and neither of them have licenses and then this great thing you've built you can't share with anyone because you don't have a license to even use what you're building on so what you say is we need to be careful when we take code mm. and we need to be careful with what the code we write so we right. need to add a license yeah. to our code but we also need to check the mm. license of other codes yeah a really smart colleague I have who's an intellectual property uh, lawyer at my university said this phrase, license in, license out. So if you want other people to okay. use something you've done, you have to see what the license you're, that's coming in. And I think that's really why this whole thing is so important. And as you might expect, this is in Code Refinery Social Coding Lesson, which used to be called Software Licensing, but that was a bit of a boring title for a general topic. And I, I think I want to share one more anecdote with the licensing because I'm going through it, it's really painful. And that is, so let's say you don't worry so much about licenses for many years. You take code from here and there because it's closed source mm. and it's fine. But at some point, you decide to open source it. Oh, yes. I have the problem. same problem. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because now you have something in the code. It's tainted. And you you may have to actually take out, mm. very, very painfully take out code that has been added a few years ago. Mm. Otherwise, you cannot open source the code. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so sooner than later. Yeah. Be careful. <laughs> My general philosophy is if it's closed source and doesn't have a license, it doesn't exist to me. And I just don't even bother looking at it mm. because... Yeah, but we, we, it no means point. you are aware that you should not take yeah. it. So this is something we need to, to yeah. be careful. And unfortunately, not everyone is that lucky to be able to ignore closed source things. Sometimes you really have to. So should we go on? Yeah. Okay. Distribution. So we'd sort of talked about this above a little bit, like this idea of packaging your code so that it's reusable. Like for example, have you ever done pip install something to install a Python package you need? Uh, someone's gone through the effort to make this code um, distributed. As a scientist, the very top level would be to archive this on somewhere like Zenodo and get a DOI for it. So that way you can cite it in a academic paper. And as Radovan had already said, every language has some way to do this. And most of them are not that difficult. It just takes a little bit of time to get started with and um, something that you should look at once you get to that point. And recently, also Fortran got a package manager. Mm. Nice. Oh yeah, which one is it? I don't know it. 
yeah, so there is a there is an effort so uh, to have a repository and I mean a registry and a packaging a little bit inspired by Cargo Rust. Mm. Oh, cool! Yeah. Okay. yeah, I didn't know. That's excellent. Yeah. And a little time check. We are already running a little yeah. over time. I don't know. We should be. I think. Continue. Should we take something? I think. Like highlight one or one thing. Or maybe we are been... getting there. No. Yeah. So let's see. Reuse is basically everything we've been talking about, and to me, the main point here is: Do you reinvent everything yourself, or are you building on the best possible base? I know many people, like someone once gave me this interesting observation that as a student, you're expected to do everything yourself. Otherwise, it's cheating. But once you get into professional life, you need to be able to build on what other people have done because you're not expected to do everything again yourself worse than other people have already done it. Of course, that's why you need to care about the licenses. And this is something that I think we can really uh, teach people a little bit better somehow. And it's sort of a difficult question, like what do you choose to reuse? How do you evaluate a project? If it I will... think what is a difficulty is, uh, do you get money if you reuse something? Hmm. For instance, if you want to get funding. Mm. It's not so obvious to write in a proposal and say, okay, I decided I, I will not reinvent the wheel, but I, mm. I'm still asking for money because mm. I need to do some more development. Well, if you say I start from scratch, mm. people will say, oh, wow, that's great. Yeah. yeah. yeah funding is organized around novel things, not yeah. about maintaining things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. So I guess we have to find a way to make the maintenance novel. Yes, anyway. good point. <laughs> okay. Collaboration is sort of everything we've been talking about and looks like it's the last one. So do you work alone and reinvent everything and no one can use your stuff? Or does your stuff become so good that everyone is using it? And other people just want to contribute to what you've done. Yeah, and one aspect is like quality of the, I don't know, code and project, but I think Richard, you said it, that um, we learn a lot from watching other people do something. Mm -hmm. and if I work in isolation, I will continue using the hammer because I know it works. Yeah. It can be nice to see somebody else do something in a completely different way. Mm -hmm. It's also about learning, not only about. Yeah. What it is. I think we shouldn't be scared to collaborate or to share and collaborate. It's, it's not only for professional, and it's not because you have reached a certain level, you can say, oh, yeah, now yeah. it's good enough uh, mm -hmm. for sharing. From the beginning, it's always good enough. Yeah. Yeah, I've learned so much by taking some other project and just watching the, like subscribing to their mailing list or watching the project on GitHub and watch what the other people are doing, what these experienced open source developers do, and then take and copy those ideas to my projects. So that's something I'd recommend everyone to try doing. Okay, so what's the future? So basically, the science with computers, I think I've seen some people that really enjoy it, and it's one of the most, um, it's very rewarding for them, or people that are just miserable with all of the problems their code is giving them, and they can never really focus on their science, or their science is always um, struggling. And if you're struggling, there's help. So that's what we're here to sort of introduce you to good practices. And we, Code Refinery gives a lot of advice for researchers for these kinds of things. So 
Yeah. Any other final closing comments? So I would like to say that in, so in two weeks, we will talk about shell and terminals. Mm -hmm. And I think many of us spent a lot of time in inside the terminal. Yeah. So we all, and speaking of watching other people do something, so we want to share different tricks that we learned. We would mm -hmm. like to learn from the audience. Um, so please also let maybe let your friends and colleagues know. Right. Um, in two weeks. Yeah. So you want to sh to share uh, tricks on how is the, how we use the terminal or uh, yeah. commands or oh. shortcuts? What, what kind of tricks? Yeah. Well, we had this Linux shell crash course a few or was it last Friday now? Yeah. So maybe we wouldn't reproduce the same things there, but really go into the practical tips and tricks we use. Like for example, someone asked me, how do I do my per directory bash history, which I can explain some and so on. Yeah, so this is really how you use shell yeah. on a daily basis and how you have set it up. Yeah. And at least I can say I've got a ton of stuff in my bash RC file, which I can. Yeah, exactly. Present. That's yeah. <laughs> yeah, and things like auto completion and searching through the history, remembering yeah. past commands, mm -hmm. editing, editing a line without pressing on the left key for thirty times. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I tend to forget how to do that, so I will learn a lot of tricks next week. Yeah. No, in two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, we hope you have learned something from here, and we hope that we've inspired you to, well, really invest a Long little more. bit into, <laughs> yeah, invest some into your education and to get more enjoyment out of your software work. And also, please contribute. Please contribute examples, also problems, solutions, so that we can show something. Also, questions via, yeah. I don't know, Twitter, HackMD, yeah. GitHub. OK, well, thanks, everyone, for watching either in person or the recording. And we will talk to you in two weeks. Thanks so much. See you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.